Hello and welcome to Acute Medicine Quiz number 4. Uh, this is the uh, answer video. Hope you all enjoyed doing the quiz. Some of the questions are of course harder than others but they uh, cover a wide variety of topics. Okay, let's go and see how you guys got on. So question 1 was all about a patient who, fairly common presentation to the Acute Medicine Unit, patient who is 75, long term catheter for enlarged prostate increasingly confused so um, in previous tutorials I would have talked about confusion as a, a sign heralding acute illness particularly in the frail elderly so he's reasonably hem hemodynamically stable although if he's got hypertension then obviously that would be a uh, relative hypotension although it's technically within normal limits his CRP is 175 now you have to always treat CRP with caution there is a lag effect seen in CRP and also um, as you get older it's questionable about how much of an immune response you're going to develop to infection so how much CR C reactive protein or functional C reactive protein are you actually going to make but here's a significantly high uh, and you couldn't um, ignore this value without probing further also to go inside with the infection he's got a temperature of 38.3 so the question is about what the single most appropriate antibiotic therapy is in this case. Um, this is also subject to NICE guidance here and you can see for yourself up on here I've put a summary flow sheet on here. And the answer is C, IV gentamicin. Uh, you can use oral phosphomycin, although this tends to be in ESBL or resistant type organisms and you basically give them as, as sachet granules for a few days. Um, but in this case he has a temperature and a very CRP and therefore gentamicin is indicated in the first instance until the cultures come back. Uh, this is the Royal Free Trust Guidelines for urinary tract uh, catheter associated urinary tract infection. Of course, the key to any infection uh, is to uh, get urine samples um, and, uh, and sample any cultures uh, that you think might be useful for your diagnosis. So you can see here that the first line, days one and two, is gentamicin, which is prescribed as per policy. And then what you're wanting to do is once you have your cultures back, uh, you want to um, step them down to oral antibiotics. As you'll know, gentamicin can be nephro and neurotoxic, so you shouldn't be using gentamicin for a prolonged period, and that would be for a total of seven days. Now, there is a role um, for other antibiotics. Um, this is a uh, protocol for pyelonephritis, and you can see that if you're non-pregnant, again, you'd use gentamicin, uh, and then you could consider using uh, ciprofloxacin. Um, if it's a second line agent, you might consider temocillin uh, or other antibiotics as guided by micro. For those of you that are rotating to the Royal Free Hospital um, or the Royal North National Orthopaedic Hospital, there is um, an antibiotic online guide. If you search micro guide on the Apple App Store, you'll be able to download all of the antibiotic policies and protocols for the Royal Free and uh, National Orthopaedic Hospital. So question two, a patient is discharged from the acute medicine unit after a medically treated non-ST elevation MI and his discharge medication includes clopidogrel. Which of the following was most likely to reduce the effectiveness of clopidogrel? So this is quite interesting. So this again is a little bit about pharmacology um, and being able to access information about medicines and their interactions. So um, this was discovered when I was uh, an SHO in cardiology some time ago. So it's been known about it for a little while. Uh, and so the answer is uh, B, omeprazole. So um, let's look at this in a bit more detail. So clopidogrel inhibits platelet aggregation and acts as a prodrug, uh, which is then, of course, converted to its active form by drug metabolizing enzymes. These are chiefly CYP 3A4 and 3A5. Now, this is also contributed to by metabolizing enzymes CYP2C19, CYP2C9 and CYP1A2. Now, what we find in um, pharmacological studies is that actually omeprazole is an inhibitor of CYP2C19, 
therefore actually the use of imeprazole uh, ex vivo reduces exposure to the active metabolite of clopidogrel. But uh, more recently, it's been noted that actually, although there is ex vivo evidence, it doesn't appear that the prescription of omeprazole um, or PPIs at least translate into clinical outcomes, i.e. what we mean by that is what's the risk of, uh, let's say, uh, further ischemic events um, if your patient is prescribed PPIs. Now, you always have to be mindful that when you're thinking about prescribing medications, of course, is, well, what's the risks and benefits of the different um, permutations of their comorbidities? So are they someone who has a known gastric disorder or prone to reflux and therefore not prescribing them a PPI would be more risky? So here, this is the current um, government advice from the government website about clopidogrel and proton pump inhibitors. It says that in light of the most recent evidence, the previous advice on the concomitant use of clopidogrel with proton pump inhibitors, i.e. that you wouldn't prescribe certainly omeprazole at least, has now been modified. Use of either omeprazole or esomeprazole with clopidogrel should be discouraged, but the current evidence does not support extending this advice to other PPIs. And again, so what we used to do and still do is if we would ordinarily give them omeprazole, we'd give them something like lansoprazole instead, where there isn't this uh, interaction with the SIP enzymes. So question three, this is about uh, toxicology and poisoning. So this is an 80-year-old female. She's nauseous, vomiting, um, and she has a hyperkalemia. So she has an ECG, and then I want you to think about what drug the patient has potentially overdosed on. So you can probably notice that there's some block on there. Um, there's some uh, QRS prolongation as well, uh, and very little in the way of P wave seen. So the answer is D, digoxin. So let's dive in and talk about digoxin toxicity. So um, death usually occurs from ventricular arrhythmias and conduction impairment or pump failure. Signs and symptoms of toxicity become more frequent with plasma concentrations above 2 nanograms per mil. Um, so of note, digoxin is one of the blood's um, uh, sorry, drugs that we can measure in blood levels. So, for example, theophylline, uh, valproate levels, carbamazepine levels, uh, digoxin is another one. Now, poor prognostic factors about whether our patients likely to survive uh, this overdose include age over 55, which this lady is, male, underlying heart disease, there's high degree atrioventricular block and hyperkalemia. Toxic features also include nausea, vomiting, lethargy, headache, and fairly uniquely to digoxin, a change in colour perception, although this is relatively rare. But as you can imagine, lots of toxidromes will be caused by, well, cures, uh, nausea, vomiting, lethargy and headache. So what are the um, cardiac effects of digoxin toxicity? Well, there's quite a few as there on there. As you can see, there's a marked bradycardia, PR prolongation, QRS prolongation, sinus arrest, atrioventricular blocks, dissociation or escape rhythms, junctional tachycardias, frequent ventricular ectopics, biogemony, and if catastrophe happens, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So how do we manage digoxin toxicity? So A, B, C, D, E approach, of course, is critical. You want to treat the hyperkalemia, obtain a digoxin level, now, usually if you want a digoxin level for routine monitoring, you would do this six hours um, post uh, taking your dose of digoxin. The treatment, there is a specific antidote for digoxin toxicity, and that's otherwise known as Digibind or Digifab, which is a digoxin-specific fragment antibody. And basically what you do is you give 200 milligrams for adult stat, and again after 15 minutes if needed. It usually takes about 15 to 30 minutes for onset. Again, you don't need to know this prescription, um, but it's worth knowing that digoxin has a specific treatment, which is digoxin-specific antibody. 
if the patient presents within an hour, you could consider giving activated charcoal. Of course, the patient will need fluid resuscitation if they've been vomiting particularly, and you would want to refer to the critical care team if the patient is unstable and likely to need vasopressor therapy or need airway protection if they are persistently vomiting. So question four, this is a cellulitic leg. And so the question was about which organism is most likely to have caused this cellulitis. So cellulitis is a very common presentation to the acute medicine unit. Most patients were able to turn around with high dose oral antibiotics and sometimes we'll need to admit them for IV antibiotics if they're unwell or unable to hold down or tolerate the oral antibiotics. So this is a bit of medical microbiology now. So the answer was C, Streptococcus pyogenes. So I've put up here the different microorganisms that are sorry, associated with cellulitis. The most common ones being Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus. And there are some more quirky um, bacteria which are associated with various things, and I've put them up here. So less common causative organisms include Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, where, for example, if you spend time in contaminated hot tubs, uh, not that I get time to do anything like that these days, sponges or nail puncture, Vibrio vulnificus, if you go in salt water exposure, Erysipelothrix ruciopathiae uh, tends to be cellulitis caused by uh, those that work as a butcher, vet or fish handlers. Pasturella multicida was also on the list. This is often a cellulitis caused by cat or dog bites. Mycobacterium marinum, aquarium keepers, Iconella curridens, uh, often seen by human bite or fist injuries, Streptobacillus monoliformis from rat bites, and Streptococcus pneumonia or Haemophilus influenza from injury, burns, or those with coexisting disease. So this question was quite a tough one. This was about a 19-year-old medical student returning from South Africa who presents to A&E, who's referred to acute medicine with dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. So herbarium swallow, um, which you can see on the slide, showed a bird beak appearance. She had a grossly distended abdomen and was tender. So let's have a quick look at both of these. So you can see here, this is a barium swallow of a patient who has a bird beak. And you basically, if you imagine that your bird is flying down to the ground, uh, you can see that obviously the beak is towards the bottom, hence the bird beak appearance. When we look at her abdominal x-ray, you can see that there are grossly distended loops of bowels as nicely uh, documented, sorry, pointed at uh, by the arrows. So the answer is B, trypanosoma cruzi. So trypanosoma cruzi is otherwise known as Chagas's disease, uh, and it's found in Latin America, and that was the clue that you were given uh, in the stem early, uh, and it was transmitted by the triatoma insect. What you then get is an erythematous nodule, which forms at the bite site, which is known as a shigoma, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, you get a fever, myalgia, unilateral conjunctivitis, and hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, this little uh, organism invades the or can invade the myenteric plexus of the esophagus and colon, causing achalasia and toxic megacolon. Uh, so this is a uh, picture of the triatoma or one of the um, uh, species of triatoma insect, and this is the shigomoma on the right-hand side, where you can see you have that erythematous area uh, where the insect has bitten. Uh, you can find more details about um, Chagas disease on the CDC website, and I've put the link on there for you. So question six, and this is a bit of a tricky one. This is about knowing some of the specifics of the um, asthma uh, life-threatening or non-life-threatening um, recognition scale. So uh, she's 23, seldom uses her salbutamol inhaler, no previous admission. So she's normally someone that has reasonably well-controlled asthma. She has a tachycardia of 120, elevated respiratory rate. Her peak flow is 40% of her predicted. And you'll notice that she has a CO2 of 5.51. So what is the level of severity of asthma is this? And the answer is D. It's a life-threatening exacerbation of her asthma. 
So when we look at the British Thoracic Society classification on moderate, acute, severe, life-threatening asthma and near-fatal, uh, starting with moderate, you have increasing symptoms but no features of acute, severe. Acute, severe, you have um, respiratory rate of 30, which this lady had, heart rate of greater than 110, this lady had, and a PEF or peak respiratory flow of 33 to 50%, and this lady was 40, so she has at least three of those criteria. So in life-threatening asthma, she had she's got the PEF of greater than 33, but you'll notice that she had a normal CO2. So remember that, of course, initially patients will hyperventilate as they are wheezing. As they begin to tire, um, their CO2 will start to rise. And that's why in this example, it follows into uh, the life-threatening asthma category because she only needs one of those. She's already got three of the acute severe, plus she has a normal CO2. Near fatal asthma is where you have a raised CO2 level require and or requiring mechanical ventilation. The um, guidelines for asthma are at www.brit-thoracic.org.uk. So question seven, this is a gun, a relatively common presentation to the acute medicine unit. This is a 47 year old who's got uh, metastatic esophageal cancer. She's become increasingly steady and fallen twice. So again, you should already be thinking about the likelihood of something like a subdural hematoma or cerebral metastases. She had a long-standing DNA CPR order and a CT head showed multiple brain metastases. She's unconscious with a fixed and dilated left pupil. This should on paper um, make you think that this patient is dying and sadly that is the case. So the appropriate management strategy is going to be one of end-of-life care. Now, there are potentially roles for things like dexamethasone. So we use dexamethasone a lot in palliative care. Um, often it will reduce the um, edema surrounding a tumour or um, post-radiotherapy or cerebral edema. Um, often will also give patient a lift and make them feel a little bit better. They often uh, gain weight and uh, they often make them quite hungry. So dexamethasone is quite a useful drug in a myriad of ways in palliative care. If the patients were seizing, there would be a role for phenytoin, although it's far more likely that we would prescribe midazolam, for example, in an infusion. Um, giving IV FFP is not going to change this lady's outcome, nor is there any evidence it is required, as there's no evidence that she is coagulopathic. She's just had a bleed um, due to the cerebral metastases. She has a do not resuscitate order and she is end stage disease, therefore either referring her to neurosurgery or intubating her and referring her to critical, yet critical care would clearly be inappropriate. So question eight is all about recognizing potential complications of asthma. And so you've got an 18 year old uh, who's been admitted with a, with a severe asthma attack and suddenly develops worsening shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. So again, you should be thinking about things like uh, pleural effusions, um, pleural uh, disease, uh, pneumothorax, uh, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, etc. Um, remember though that this chap is an 18 year old and so let's see what we would investigate next. And the answer is C, chest x-ray. It is likely that this young man has developed a uh, associated um, pneumothorax, hence the pyritic pain. PE would be very unlikely in someone who has uh, is normally mobile, fit and well, and age 18, and particularly male. Um, peak flow measurement, again, is not going to help uh, at this time. The patient, if they have significant pyritic pain, is unlikely to perform a satisfactory measurement. Both arterial blood gas and echocardiogram could be useful, but they're not diagnostically going to tell you what's wrong. Again, it is very unlikely uh, that there would be anything abnormal about this uh, young lad's echo. An arterial blood gas would simply show hypoxia, um, and so again, it's not particularly diagnostic. Therefore, the answer is C, chest x-ray. So this is a tricky one, question nine. So this is about the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. So 
Um, she's a 70 year old frail female. She has a sudden onset of short chest pain, shortness of breath, cough, growth, hemoptysis. So all of those things um, should be screaming pulmonary embolism at you. She is anemic, white cell counts, elevated. I've highlighted in blue um, the particularly significant standout thing because hopefully reading the stem you'll have a rough idea um, that this patient has pulmonary embolism. You'll notice that she has quite a significant renal impairment. So when we look at the different options, it's actually B. Now there are a couple of caveats with this. So if you were to proceed with CTPA with her kidneys, it is possible that she may develop uh, contrast nephropathy or worse than her kidney function. On the other hand, if you were to go with B, you have to have relatively clear lungs and a normal chest x-ray. So you have to consider when you're um, making your management decision about how you're going to diagnose the pulmonary embolism, you need to obviously balance her kidney function and the state of her chest x-ray. But because of she has a stated AKI um, and chronic renal impairment, then the answer becomes B. D-dimer test is not helpful because it's going to be positive. She's had a recent hospital stay and she's older. So remember that in low risk patients, um, those over age 50, if you multiply the age by 10, you can have an age adjusted cutoff for D-dimer. So hers will be um, positive by virtue of age alone. Chest x-ray, of course, cannot be used to diagnose pulmonary embolism. It's not specific enough. Uh, an echocardiogram um, can be used if you are concerned about massive pulmonary embolism and you want to see if there's any evidence of right heart strain, um, then you could use an echo. But again, it won't you won't see the clot, of course, on an echo, whereas you'll see the filling defects on a CTPA or ventilation perfusion scan. There is a tutorial on Moodle, which I've done for you on pulmonary embolism, where it comes a little bit in more detail about uh, this question. So question 10, a 30 year old female presents to the emergency department with lethargy and a two week history of weight loss. So you should be thinking about your differential diagnosis of weight, less, weight loss and lethargy. And hopefully you should be thinking about endocrine. The ECG shows right bundle branch block, which you should know is probably a normal variant in the vast majority of cases. So I've thrown in a bit of a cheeky red herring there for you. So this patient has a low sodium, a high potassium, normal thyroid function tests, has a history of weight loss and lethargy. This should um, be telling you that this is probably Addison's disease. So the answer is um, A, take a serum glucose. So we'll talk about Addison's disease in a moment, but Although um, there's no evidence that you're going to need to administer intravenous insulin, if anything, with Addison's, you're going to be hypoglycemic, so C is wrong. Um, you could consider administering intravenous calcium uh, because of her hyperkalemia, although she has a normal ECG, aside from right blunder branch block, which is not a, in keeping with her hypokalemia. Therefore, there's no immediate need to give IV calcium. You may wish to administer intravenous hydrocortisone um, Fludrocortisone is typically given oral for postural hypotension and Addison's disease. So you want to make sure that the patient is not hypoglycemic, therefore the answer is A. So Addison's disease in brief is an insufficient production of hydrocortisone in the adrenal glands. Common symptoms include polyuria, polydipsia, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, lethargy and fatigue. This has a fairly classical pattern um, biochemically of hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypoglycemia. So thinking about our D for disability in A, B, C, D, E, hyperglycemia must be identified and treated. It is important to note, however, that ongoing treatment would include IV hydrocortisone. So question 11. This is a little bit about un uh, epidemiology and when you get asked questions um, like what is the most likely diagnosis you also want to think about what's the most likely at a population level and if you bear that in mind that might give you a clue um, as to this answer and of course when you look at the x-ray so this is a 35 year old shortness of breath his saturations are 95 but when he mobilizes his saturations 
drop to 85%. So what you're doing is you're basically doing the oxygen walk test here. Uh, so this is the time for patient. I would walk up and down majors and see what happens to his SATs. And in his case, they drop. Now let's look at his x-ray. So his x-ray shows widespread bilateral fine changes. There isn't consolidation that you might see in a chest x-ray. There's no dense shadowing that you might see in metastatic malignancy um, or cannonball infiltrate. There's fluoride widespread fibrotic type change or ground glass appearance is what you probably see on CT. So the answer is D, advanced HIV infection. So again, breaking this down a little bit through epidemiology and appearance on the chest x-ray. So there's no uh, dense lesions on here to, to suggest metastatic malignancy. Um, so for example, you'll look at more cannonball type infiltrates as seen in things like renal, breast uh, and testicular cancer. Uh, atypical pneumonia, well, there aren't any consolidative change, so atypical pneumonia is unlikely. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in someone age 35 would be extraordinarily rare um, unless you have a genetic condition such as Langerhans, histiocytosis X and things like that. But then, so when we look at B and D, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, again, is a very rare condition. It is far more likely that given the age and x-ray that this is pneumocystis pneumonia and therefore the answer is D. Pneumocystis is a condition seen in advanced HIV infection. Bearing in mind, uh, London also has a higher rate of HIV infection compared to other regions in the United Kingdom. This should point you towards um, HIV infection. So question 12, so a 59 year old with COPD is admitted for the fifth time in two months. Now that key point should stand out to you as that this is a patient who has um, either high demand for services or has uncontrolled symptoms um, or has sort of anxiety um, issues that require management, which is typified by the sudden onset shortness of breath and palpitations whilst out shopping. Now, from a clinical point of view, you'll notice read that there is no increase in wheeze or change in colour of sputum. And now this goes against the hallmarks of a exacerbation of her COPD. She has a normal chest X-ray and ECG, so there's no obvious evidence of pneumonia or infection, uh, or that she needs antibiotics. She feels as is common that she needs a further course of steroids and antibiotics. So this is all about managing um, patients who are breathless. And remember, there's a very big difference between being breathless and being hypoxic. The two are not mutually exclusive. Uh, if I know, for example, I run up a hill, I'll be breathless, but hopefully I'm not hypoxic. And that's just because I haven't been to a gym for a while. So when you approach breathlessness um, and patients who have COPD, as you'll know, COPD is a managed condition, but it's not a curative condition. Um, and so often patients feel uh, getting to this spiral where they uh, might get a bit breathless. They get panicked by that breathlessness. And th these patients go in a sort of quite a sort of vicious cycle uh, where they then become very panicked, very become become extraordinarily breathless. And then they call an ambulance and then they come back to the hospital. So let's have a quick look. So there's no evidence to suggest uh, an echocardiogram is going to be particularly helpful at this time. Um, if she was a dermatist and you were worried about secondary pulmonary hypertension from COPD, then maybe it'd be useful. You're certainly not going to discharge this lady. There might be a um, uh, sort of inclination to do this because she's had numerous um, hospital admissions. Um, but actually, by doing nothing, you're not going to actually improve things at all. Um, although it's quite important to not enforce um, or create an institutionalized patient, and we can talk about that at another time, um, you have to try and get this balance right and think about what can you do to actually prevent hospital admissions which aren't necessary. There's no evidence that she needs antibiotics and steroids, therefore the answer is not C. D, committing further steroids might make her feel better, but actually is potentially going to do a harm if they're not indicated. So you want to think about the um, effects of long-term steroids, such as um, steroid-induced diabetes, um, osteopenia and osteoporosis, and so on. 
So what we've started doing, which works really well, particularly in patients who are breathless, is either to prescribe low-dose lorazepam, such as 0.5 milligrams PRN, or low-dose Oromorph, sort of 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams uh, PRN, and this helps settle their breathlessness. So question 13, so this again is about asthma, and you're reviewing the patient uh, in recess with your acute medicine registrar. I've pointed out some of the interesting bits here. So he's got a tremor, which of course is not normal in 28 year olds. His chest x-ray is normal and his CRP is four. So you should be thinking that this patient probably doesn't have a significant sepsis or infection. But his lactate has gone up from 2.5 to 6.3. So what's the cause of the elevated lactate? Now, what should stand out to you in that I've put that he has a tremor for a reason. And that's because the answer is D, salbutamol toxicity. So mesenteric ischemia in someone who's young would be extraordinarily rare. And so it's very unlikely to be the source of the uh, rising lactate. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that he has near fatal asthma or sepsis because his CRP and chest x-ray were normal. There's no evidence again to suggest he has attention in thorax, so the answer is D, salbutamol toxicity. I've put up here um, a list of the drugs which can cause elevated lactate, such as nalezolid, epinephrine, propofol, paracetamol, beta-2 agonists, uh, which of course uh, butamol is one and theophylline and I've put on there a link to um, uh, a review article on causes of elevated lactate. In summary other causes of elevated lactate include shock, postcardiac arrest, regional tissue ischemia, DKA, drugs and toxins, anaerobic muscle activity, uh, so sometimes um, Lactate is used as a surrogate marker for um, clinical, true clinical seizures versus non-epileptic seizures. Thiamine deficiency, liver failure and mitochondrial disease. Question 14. So this lady has severe chest pain radiating to her back. She has a history of hypertension. She, uh, she has a normal chest x-ray. Her D-dimer was grossly elevated with an elevated troponin. What's the single most appropriate treatment? So again, you want to think about having done cardiology, you want to think about what the possible um, diagnoses are. Um, you should, with the D-dimer, be pointed towards uh, aortic dissection. And so the answer is E, urgent surgery. So this is a lady wh which we would do a CT aortogram and refer emerge urgently to the cardiothoracic surgeons. Um, so the ACE inhibitor, um, although you might consider for hypertension, um, you would treat them more aggressively with a labetalol infusion, for example, if you wanted to bring down um, her pressure prior to surgery. So you don't want to give an antiplatelet agent to someone who has a dissecting aorta. Neither do you want to do give low molecular weight heparin or percutaneous coronary intervention. Remember her ECG was normal, so she needs urgent surgery. Um, there's a really good link here to an article which has been published by the Royal Brompton. It's a really good um, uh, detailed article or review about aortic emergencies. Question 15 was all about contraindications to inserting a nasopharyngeal airway and the answer is C. So you'd want to be careful with A, B and C. Um, D is just um, an inflamed nose. Um, warfarin, you can put in a nasopharyngeal airway. Still, you just have to be very careful. Similarly to B, for example, it depends on which way the fracture went um, and whether their nose is still accessible or not. Nasal polyps, again, you would just put plenty of KY jelly down to make sure that it slides down smoothly. So the answer is E. Um, so just this bit of gruesome value, you'll notice that the arrow there is pointing to uh, the outline uh, of a nosopharyngeal airway which has gone um, uh, transphenoidal, shall we say, and you can see that the ring effect is here. So the question 16, what is the single most appropriate method of administering 24% oxygen? So the answer is B, 2 litres of oxygen via a Venturi face mask. Remember when prescribing um, Put you want or you want a patient who uh, to have a specific concentration of oxygen so 24 28 35 and so on you want to use the venturi system 
2 litres of oxygen via nasal cannula is not the same as 24% oxygen. 4 litres of oxygen via plain face mask is somewhere between uh, sort of 24 and 35%. Um, similarly with uh, D and of course you would never administer 2 litres of oxygen via a non rebreathe mask you should always administer at least 10 litres of oxygen otherwise you will end up rebreathing uh, because the flow is low um, there is a tutorial again on Moodle and my YouTube channel about oxygen Question 17, so this is about um, benzodiazepine toxicity. Um, this is um, potentially fairly common. If you give too much of Nazlam, then you can, of course, make the patient drowsy and show sign of airway obstruction. So again, this is knowing about your A, B, C, D, E approach. And the answer is A, insert an oral pharyngeal airway and high flow oxygen. Now, you'll notice on there that there is the option of flumazenil, and we'll talk about flumazenil in a moment. You would hope that the midazolam will wear off eventually, so intubation and ventilation will probably not be helpful, as it's very unlikely that the midazolam will wear off, and then you then have to wear them off, uh, wean them off sedation. So you've given them a double hit of sedative, so it's probably not going to be particularly wise. Naloxone is a reversal agent for opioids, therefore there is no role in uh, benzodiazepine overdose. And of course, you would got to give them a high flow oxygen. But remember that they are showing signs of obstructive breathing, therefore the patient requires an airway. So flumazenil is a drug used for the reversal of sedative effects of benzodiazepines. Um, standard dose, again, you don't need to recall this to memory, is 200 micrograms, so for 15 seconds, and then given uh, in small boluses per minute as required. What's important is that flumazenil has multiple and very common side effects, including anxiety, diplopia, dry mouth, flushing, headache, hyperhidrosis or severe sweating, hyperventilation, hypotension, palpitation, seizures, vertigo, vomiting, or like a withdrawal type syndrome. So you have to be really cautious about using flumazenil, um, and so rarely should be used. Uh, I've also put the link up there to you to uh, look up uh, flumazenil on the BNF. So question, say, question 18, so this is all about driving um, after a TIA. And the answer is B, that he mustn't drive for four weeks. So it's worth knowing eventually, particularly towards graduation, about um, some of the DVLA rules uh, which exist for driving and acute medical conditions. I've put up here the link to the guide for DVLA and medical conditions and basically this is a, a guide for um, medical professionals so it'll give you a list of conditions um, and whether you should or shouldn't drive and when you do or do not need to report to uh, the driver and vehicle licensing agency. So question 19, this is all about upper GI bleed. Have a look at the next picture. You should hopefully recognize that there's quite a large ulcer here. So um, this is the base of the uh, ulcer here, which you can see uh, in the right hand side of the picture. And again, common things are common. Gastric ulcer is the most common cause of GI bleeding. Uh, therefore, the answer is A, gastric ulcer. So question 20, which of the following is not part of a routine confusion screen? And the answer is D. It's um, syphilis, serology. All the others are a part of the confusion screen. So when we think about a confusion or dementia screen, we do standard blood tests. So hematology and biochemistry, thyroid function tests, B12 and folate. MSU, if we're worried about infection or there's evidence of delirium, chest x-ray, ECG, syphilis and HIV, if clinically suspected. Uh, you may wish to take a CSF sample if you're worried about creutzfeldt jakob disease. You may want to do an EEG or electroencephalogram if you're concerned about the cause of delirium, new variant CJD or subclinical seizures. And of course, you'd want to do structural imaging to rule out cerebral pathology, such as acute on chronic or subdural hematoma, uh, infarctions, uh, and so on. Okay, so that concludes um, acute medicine quiz four. Um, as I say, some of the answers, some of the questions were tougher than others. You're very welcome to email me directly or put a question on Moodle, and we'll have more interactive tutorials in your acute medicine slot. Take care, everybody, and well done again. Bye bye.